So here's our day by day for PFT 109. <laughs> All right, so we are looking, is a 10 day class. Um, sorry, I, I dodged a bullet. Uh, People watching this recording know what I'm talking about. But uh, all right, let's look, at, let's look at days one through 10 here. So um, there are no holidays in this class. So this is going to be on the 20th. This is day one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, our final day for this class uh, is going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10 is going to be November 2nd. So that is our final day for this class. We will do an in person park meeting on October 30th, which will be kind of fun. It'll be the day before Halloween. Uh, but um, days one and two, we're going to talk about like defining older populations and talk about the physiologic considerations and how they are slightly different. Tomorrow, we'll look at the psychology. Uh, then we're going to dive into fitness assessments for seniors, which will make a lot of sense considering we've been talking about them for the last couple in-person meetings, uh, as well as some safety guidelines. Then we will get into flexibility and cardio training for our senior clients, uh, movement prep for our senior clients resistance training for our senior clients. So then that'll be the entire OPT template that we've gone through. We will have big chart day on our seventh day uh, where we will go over literally every NASM acute variable that exists. And then we will end it with common uh, medical conditions and uh, exercise modifications that we should make for our senior clients, which will make a lot of sense considering we just went through our special populations class. Then we'll have that in-person meeting where we'll do some mock uh, exercise training sessions, which will be really fun. Um, basically, uh, leading up to this, I'm going to kind of create some very simple NASM style OPT workouts. You guys will get them ahead of time and then you can bring those to the park with you and we'll put everybody through them, which will be kind of fun. Um, so that is our plan for this course. And then we'll have our review and final exam. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that is, so we, we are in PFT, like I said, we're in PFT 109. This is Lifespan Fitness Solutions, which is a big fancy way of saying uh, senior fitness program design, right? So we are going to be working out of um, this manual right here. I'm going to email this to you guys tonight. Um, this is our senior uh, fitness specialist manual, meaning that this is actually based on NASM's SFS certification. So uh, if you guys, you know, when you graduate and you become NASM trainers and you need to get CEUs, if you ever decide you want to market yourself towards working with senior populations, um, this could be a really good certification for you to get in your careers. Um, and I think it's worth like point, uh, one. So you get this and like a couple other certs and that'll earn your all of your CEUs for you. So this is the manual we're going to be working out of. Um, and we're going to go ahead and dive into this first chapter. And I, I say chapter with quotations because it's literally, what, three pages? <laughs> so um, let's take a look at it, shall we? So chapter one here, uh, if we are defining an older adult population. So our objectives for this uh, PowerPoint is to understand what I mean when we talk about like an adult population and how it happened. Uh, we are gonna talk about boomers. We are gonna be talking about the population boom that did occur. Um, recent trends and injury rates, uh, how it is associated with rising healthcare costs and the implications of what that means. So when we're talking about an older population, right? When we're talking about like training a senior, um, we are talking about like in general, when we say like an older client, we're talking about the gradual loss of a functional capacity, right? So like as we get older, we do lose certain functional capabilities, but there's really no perfect way to define that, right? Like, like the U.S. like legally defines a senior as 65 and older, right? But like my parents are not 65 yet and they look ancient. In fact, actually, you know what? This is going to be a weird thing to do, but only because my mom just sent me a picture. You want to see my hillbilly parents? Uh, <laughs> they went clam digging, which is a thing that you do in the Northwest. But like, you know, you look at my dad, like he looks 65, the man's in his fifties, <laughs> yeah, like, like, you know, he looks very, very, very old. Uh, <laughs> um, and I'll tell that to him to his face. So, you know, don't worry. I'm not, I'm not talking about my dad behind his back. Uh, <laughs> uh, but that's just, you know, kind of how it looks, you know, that my parents both work you know, with their hands their whole life, you know? Um, and so like, there's really no perfect way to define this. So we're going to look at a couple different ways to define this. 
none of these are right, none of these are wrong. Um, what we're saying when we say a senior is like a gradual loss of, you know, capacity. So even if you had somebody who's in their 40s, you know, uh, but they've just never been mobile, you may have to make some of these senior uh, adjustments, you know, in which you wouldn't think would apply. You're like, 40s, that's super far away from seniors, you know? But like I said, I've known clients who are in their 70s who are some of the fittest people I know. Um, and I've known people in their, in their, you know, 40s and 50s who are not. So here's a couple different ways we're gonna look at it. There is chronological, this is the most basic, this is what you think of when you think of like age, and it's the number of years since birth, you know, 32, right? Um, that is chronological aging. But then there is also biological aging. Biological aging is the amount of decline evident in the body, you know? Um, again, love my parents, but they've had, you know, gray hair since I can remember. <laughs> so like, if you were to look at that and base that on like their age, well, you know, biologically, you would think they might be a little bit older. Um, did you guys actually, this is funny. I don't want to totally sidetrack too much, but did you actually see they finally actually did the first long-term evidence and it just came out um, like I, a couple weeks ago, I think they finally did tie stress to hair going gray. Hey, did you guys see this? It's, it's literally in the news right now. No, talk about it, please. Yeah, man, my mom, my mom would yell at me all the time when I was growing up. <laughs> like, and she'd be like, you are giving me gray hairs by the day. God, and she'd like tear off on a rant and then like storm out. <laughs> Cause I would do something like, I remember my mom yelled at me for over an hour one time uh, because the cops got called because we were shooting off fireworks in the forest behind my house, which is a horrible place to set off fireworks, uh, <laughs> you know, where there's all kinds of leaves. Um, <laughs> and literally, my mom would claim that I was giving her gray hair by the day. Turns out my mom was right. <laughs> like, you know, they've, they've always, I think that's always been like a joke, but literally, um, it's in the news right now. They just finally did like, they finally found like the specific genetic ties. Um, and they have found that stress makes your hair go gray. So if you guys, you know, what's that, Irene? Yeah, but you know, my dad, he had gray hair in his 20s. Hmm. Some people are born. Yeah, some people are like that. I, I, I don't, I, there's actually a real term for it. I just call it Steve Martin syndrome. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Remember, because like Steve Martin had gray hair like his whole career. Um, yeah. Or Leslie Nielsen, right? Leslie Nielsen had gray hair when he was in his 30s, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I don't know what that is. Um, <laughs> maybe you're doing from pretty, uh, pretty Woman. What's his name? Oh, Richard Gere. That's another one. Yeah, gray hair. Like his whole life, you know? Yeah. Um, so anyway, that's chronological, right? It's like outward signs of aging. You know, um, people have always told me that I look way older. Um, like, uh, people have thought that I was in my 30s when I was like, you know, in my teens. Because <laughs> uh, I apparently have a lot of lines on my forehead. So that's one. Um, so that's, that's biological. Uh, and then there's functional. And this is the one that's probably most applicable to us as trainers, right? Functional is determined by your appearance of like mobility or strength. And then a little bit of this is like mental capacity too. Um, man, speaking of mental capacity uh, and like aging, I had these two clients who were probably in their 40s, I think. Maybe one of them was in their 50s. Um, and they were both teachers. They were both like computer science teachers. Uh, and they had never like worked out before, but their doctor was like, look, you got to start exercising. So they showed up and I signed them both up as like a married couple. And I have never had such a hard time coaching physical movements before. Like these people were very intense. I mean, they were teachers, they were computer science teachers, um, but their mental capacity for like physical movements and like physical athleticism, it was crazy. I was just like, I mean, I would literally have to explain the same movements between every, like they would do the movement, they do a complete set. I have to start from scratch on the next one. It was pretty interesting. And I always think of that whenever I talk about functional um, aging, because it seemed like they're, they just, they were way older than they actually were. They moved and they like, they, they acted like they were way older and they were only in their forties. Um, but that was, that was kind of an interesting example of like functional. This is the one that's probably most applicable to us. 
Um, then there's primary versus secondary aging. These are kind of their own categories that don't really fall. These don't really contradict these categories here, but primary is independent of disease. This is kind of what is considered aging, right? When you look at someone and you see something that is just worn down over time, you know, you know like, um, like functional aging is kind of an example of primary aging, right? Uh, but then there is like secondary aging, which is like due to some pathological reason, you know, somebody might have like a body part that's younger or older, you know, like if somebody has, you know, been active their entire life, you know, and they're very, very, very healthy um, and they're an athlete or something, you know, secondary aging wise, like they've pathologically been keeping themselves healthy, you know, so they might seem much younger. Um, I think that's what you see a lot in Hollywood. You know, look at Paul Rudd. <laughs> Dude's in his 50s, right? It looks like he's in his 30s. That's like the big joke uh, is that Paul Rudd like doesn't age. Um, but it's true. Like, you know, he's, he's successful. He has had a lot of like, you know, money and he's eaten well and he takes really good care of himself. And people ask him, it's like, did you work out like crazy with your training? He's like, nah, I kind of just did the same stuff I always did. You know, and it's like clear that he's taken time to like take care of himself. So pathologically, he's never really gotten like very, very, very ill. So it hasn't made him seem older. Um, same thing is happening, you know, when you see somebody have a heart attack, it almost like it ages them intensely. Um, so that's kind of, these are not like their own categories that contradict these. These are sort of like, they kind of feed into these. So those are kind of what we consider when it comes to aging. And so we know that there are interactions with your environment, you know. Um, like for instance, like I, you know, I always talk about how like I'm from the Northwest. Jesse, did you grow up in the Northwest, like your whole life? Or are you are you from Seattle? Yes, sir. Man, I'd be super curious if you could do the same thing that I did. Um, so when I was in school, I actually went to I went to an acting school for a bit, and I took a makeup class, and they shined a black light on everyone's skin. Not just a black light, but like a um, a special like UV black light and it showed skin damage. And so it showed all the kids, we went around all the kids in, in class and stuff. And the older you were, you know, the more skin damage you had because you've had years of exposure to the sun. And uh, our teacher was in his fifties um, and he showed his and it blew, I remember like we were all like, you know, 20 years old and it blew our mind. Cause we were like, whoa, that's so different. Like his skin just looks so different. He couldn't tell naked eye, but with the light, it was very different. And then it came around to me and I had just moved to California from Oregon and everyone was like, have you ever gone outside? What do you just stay indoors all day? And I was like, what? No, I'm, I go out. Like, and they were like, it was apparently like, it just looked totally the same as it like would. And I remember seeing the people from Southern California and there you would see little bits of damage that you wouldn't normally notice. Um, and that's an example of like how our environment does affect our aging. You know, your skin looks older, the more exposure to the sun that you have, you know, um, and it could be affected by things like your nutrition as well. Uh, we do know that like, if you eat healthy foods, that is going to result in like you know, like your skin quality and stuff. If you have more vitamin E, that's really good for your skin. If you have plenty of calcium, that's very good for your bones. So if you have low bone density, you might be, you might seem older than someone who is actually older than you, but has had a good diet, you know? So that's kind of something that we're talking about. So, you know, for those of you, the, one of the reasons I'm spending a kind of a lot of time on this topic, um, if you are looking at this and you're like, ah, I'm just not interested in training seniors, you know, it's not, it doesn't seem like something that's really going to affect me. I'm going to work primarily with this. You might find that, yeah, you work with somebody in their thirties, but they have the body of a 50 year old, you know, um, or, or older, you know, like even like, I, like I said, I literally had, I've had 70 year old clients doing burpees, you know what I mean? Doing squat jumps. And I've had 20 year olds that I'm not comfortable doing it with. Um, so don't, Yes, this is a senior class, but really this is a class on uh, like what you should really kind of want to take away from this whole course is how to modify and make things harder or make things easier and land in that sweet spot to challenge your client without overworking them. And so when we are talking about seniors, that's going to be something that does come up a lot. Um, but don't let this throw you off and be like, ah, eh, senior class, I'm not, this isn't the population I'm interested in, you know? Um, because our genetic code 
you know, no matter what your chronological age is, how many years old you are, it can be affected by how physically active you are. It can be affected by your nutrition and it can be affected by like, are you making healthy choices? Are you moving? Are you getting up? Are you moving around? You know? Um, so, uh, but talking about like seniors in general, we've got about 35 million older adults living in the U S right now. It's about 12 and a half percent of the overall population. But that is seniors 65 and older, right? Here's the thing. By the year 2050, we're expecting to have about 70 million, and it'll be about 25% of the population. Because when you think about it, when we talk about like boomers, right? We talk about like baby boomers. That is a huge population boom that happened. And they are not seniors yet. These are people who are still in the workforce. They're still working eight hours a day, 40 hours a week or more, obviously. Um, and so because of that, these are people who really aren't probably don't have a lot of time to commit to their health. And then in several years from now, we're going to see this point where suddenly they're retired. They finally have time to work on themselves. They finally have time to take care of themselves and they've got the disposable time and income to do it and the drive to do it so they can stick around and, you know, be around there for their kids and grandkids and stuff. So we're going to see 25%, one in four people, 65 years or older by the middle of this century. And so one of the reasons we're talking about this is because we are going to see there is going to be a burden on social and economic costs, right? Um, the older we get, the more we tend to suffer from chronic diseases, right? And so that's costing you. And this is a very interesting statistic here. It costs for every older adult who has chronic diseases around $12,500 a year in terms of healthcare costs, which is a crazy high amount of healthcare costs, right? And a lot of that is diseases that is for the most part preventable. So there's a lot of times where like, you know, when I used to work at like Biggest Loser, for instance, right? In order to go there, you know how much it was? It was two to three grand a week, depending on what package you bought. That is a crazy high amount of money, right? And sometimes people will be like, man, how can people afford that? And you know, it's nuts that is still cheaper than having a heart attack or diabetes or, you know, a stroke or any condition that any chronic health condition, um, that is still less money than that, you know? So it's an interesting statistic to look at for sure. We definitely see there are rising healthcare costs, um, associated with like the elderly. Um, so, uh, these implementation implications of this population boom, right? We are going to see greater causes of, uh, of morbidity and comorbidities. Um, we are going to see sometimes, um, decreases in healthy lifestyles rather than increases, which is not great. That's why we want to try to prevent things like cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and all these other things by trying to be as mobile as possible. We will see a lot of coronary artery disease in particular you know, hypertension, heart problems, things like that. Um, and those problems are set early in life, but they don't show symptoms until later. You don't really see the effects of an unhealthy lifestyle, you know? Um, like, let's look at anybody in this call right now. There's a call of fit people. I know all of you, right? You guys are in great shape. But if you were to, and if you were to start going to McDonald's every single day right now, you know what? It wouldn't have that much of an external effect because you guys or maybe eat healthy a lot of other times, or maybe you're active, you know, but anybody in this call, if you start doing that, there are going to be implications and you might not notice them for years. And then suddenly once you get older and, you know, we start to see the effects of like aging, that's where it starts to cause problems. And there are people who are doing what I just described right now for real in the world we live in. And we're going to need to be around to train them. <laughs> so, um, that is why we have this certification. That's why we're talking about it. Um, so let's go ahead and get into the physiologic differences here. Um, and talk about how that's different. Do you guys have any questions? Yeah, question. Um, can you go over primary and secondary again? Um, cause you said sure. that primary is kind of like functional. It yeah. Falls on when you look at someone and you're like, man, that person's youthful. That's like that external judgment that you're making, that's kind of like an example of like primary aging. It's what you think of when you think of aging. 
right? You know when somebody says like age is just a number, right? And they're talking about how like somebody who is just super vibrant and fit, even though they might be up in up there in years, you know? Um, and they're like, age is just a number, you know? And they're out there playing basketball. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. that person there, that's what you think of when you think of like primary aging. You're like, yeah, age is just a number. You are super fit, you know? <laughs> um, whereas secondary, it's like, you know, like my mom, for instance, my mom really slowed down after she had her heart attack. Um, and which is, which is tough because she is kind of prone to a sedentary attitude. My mom tends to be kind of a couch potato. And, you know, no doubt that is what led to her heart attack. That and the fact that my parents love to eat unhealthy foods. Um, <laughs> that and the fact that my mom loves to stress out about stuff. <laughs> she, she was, had there, yeah. She was heading down the heart attack road for, for years. Um, and she's made some really great changes. Now they're eating a lot healthier, you know. Um, but uh, she is definitely suffering from like secondary aging, you know. If you were to look at my mom now and you were to look at her just three years ago, pre-heart attack, it's a pretty staunch difference. She looks pretty significantly changed. Um, and, you know, she's got a few more wrinkles around the eyes, her hair is gray, um, whereas like it's, it held out for a long time. She had brown, dark brown hair, like I've got my hair from my mom, um, you know, for years. Uh, and then just heart attack and then like within months, totally gray, you know? So that's kind of like secondary aging. It's like where maybe a pathological disease sort of takes you out of the game and rapidly ages you, you know? Uh, here, here's a really good example. This is not a disease, but here's a really great example of like, in my opinion, what secondary aging is. Uh, Obama 2008 versus 2016. <laughs> That is a pretty big difference in not that many. That's 2008 versus 2017. Skin looks really good still, but look at the hair, right? That's kind of just like, if, the, if, if you look at like how the presidency ages people, like George Bush was a great one. George Bush uh, before, after. Man, he like, cr like, he looks young and vibrant there and looks like an old man here, you know? Um, because it's just a stressful job. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> um, so that's anyway. a great example of a um, secondary aging. Yeah, it's where something ages you. You know, that's Got what it. secondary aging is. Whereas primary aging is just like, look, years happen. You know, we get old. <laughs> that's what I, I kind of think the difference is. Um, or at least that's how I've always explained it to people. <laughs> All right. Um, Let's look at some of these anatomic differences here. Um, so we're gonna look at a, at a physiologic level here. Um, uh, so we wanna sort of understand some of the physiologic and anatomical differences. There are some structural things. Sorry, I'm gonna turn my lights on. Uh, but there's also some physiologic things happening as well. And so we wanna have a pretty good understanding of that. Um, especially when we look at the nervous system. There's a lot of nervous system changes that do happen. Obviously, there's also going to be musculoskeletal changes and cardiorespiratory changes. So, you know, this is where we are looking at differences in our heart and lungs, our skeletal muscle, bones, and nervous system. So, in the nervous system, um, they do kind of do a quick review here. I'm going to move to this pretty quick because I know you guys are, are solid on your understanding of how this is organized. <laughs> um, but in your nervous system, you've got two primary divisions, right? You get the central nervous system. Uh, which is sort of the command center, right? That's your brain and spinal cord. It's responsible for like making decisions, right? Um, and then you've got your peripheral nervous system, which is basically gathering all the information so that your central nervous system has data, you know? Um, like your, you are the one in charge of your bank account, but like your banking app is telling you you know, how much money you've got in the account, right? So you're the central nervous system, you're making the decisions, but you're getting the data from your app, you know? Um, that's like your peripheral nervous system. So all the nerves that are gathering, you know, in your skin, for instance, those are peripheral nerves that send info back to my nervous system. And then my central nervous system goes, okay, well, that's not too much friction. But if I like scraped it with my nails, my body be like, ah, God, pull the arm away, that hurts, you know? So um, that's your nervous system. 
as a quick review here. Now, there are going to be some age-related changes here. As we get older, there are some structural changes that happen in our nervous system. The body experiences, um, actually on an anatomic level, a thinning of your dendrites. So when you look at when you look at your uh, nervous system, right, you remember what a neuron looks like. You know, you have got the main cell body here, you've got the axon, and then you've got all these fingers right here, which are the dendrites, right? They are there to gather information. Um, they're like the peripheral part. You know, your, your individual neurons are arranged kind of similarly to the way your nervous system is arranged. You've got the decision maker here in the center, right? But the information's got to get gathered in order to get to that center. So this is very much peripheral, and this is sort of central here. And so like your dendrites gather information, but when they get thin, they don't have as strong of a connection to other neurons. You know, like this little finger here is supposed to be attached to something, but it starts to get really, really, really thin. So we see like, I'm gonna see if I can find a picture of this, of uh, dendrites. Uh, oh man, we are real deep. I actually don't even know how to interpret most of these pictures. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is beyond me. <laughs> You're going to need a neurologist. <laughs> um, I guess this kind of works though, but you can see they do get kind of thinner and thinner and that's going to make it much harder um, for communication to happen in the nervous system, right? So signals are going to get lost. Signals are going to travel a little more slowly. And so that's part of what we see in terms of structural changes. Um, that can lead to sensory change. So we see a loss of sensitivity in your nervous system. We also see a loss of proprioception. Obviously, your balance is going to be worse if your nervous system can't communicate because it's got to be, remember, proprioception is information going away and information coming in constantly and all the time, right? Um, so when you have like information going slowly in either one direction or another, this is going to result in loss of balance and loss of mobility. And that's why we tend to, you know, uh, all of us in here, we're worried about when we hear our grandma fell again, you know? And it's like, fell. like when was the last time you as an adult fell all the way to the ground, you know? Like, yeah, you might have tripped over something, but you know, with a young brain, we're pretty good at catching ourselves, right? Um, but we do see that start to slow down a little bit as we get older. And then we do also sometimes see some behavioral changes as well. Um, so there's sometimes our personality changes. Um, and we also sometimes see the ability to absorb large amount of information at a time sort of decreases. And that's why when we're talking about this, we are gonna talk about like explaining things to our clients that are seniors, we're going to slow it down a little bit. Like, I would not be speaking this fast if I didn't have faith that all of you got young brains, you know? <laughs> um, and here's kind of an interesting thing. This is kind of a poorly put together uh, sentence on this PowerPoint here, but we see a 10 to 15% decrease. Um, that is in brain volume. Um, or brain mass. Uh, so the brain actually, when we get older, actually weighs less because those dendrites are sort of thinning out and disappearing. So um, that's gonna result in loss or slow communication. We are gonna see sensory changes like a decrease in visual acuity. Um, we're gonna see, so it's gonna be harder to actually pinpoint see things uh, or maybe see things that are far away. Uh, we're also gonna see less peripheral vision. Um, this is one of the biggest differences actually. Um, and one of the things that they test for uh, with seniors is they'll put them in that little you know, thing and they'll pull something from the side and then eventually they can see their peripheral vision. Uh, that gets lost as we get older. We actually have less peripheral vision. Um, there's loss of contrast, which means that sometimes like colors start to blend together. Like if there's like blue on black writing, like that's not, there's not a lot of difference between those two. They're both dark colors. It might be really hard for your senior clients to see. Uh, and then depth perception, obviously. Um, that's why you see people do, you know, this thing when they're reading, when they kind of adjust back and forth. Um, we hear the same thing with hearing. We see a loss of hearing acuity. Uh, we sometimes see sound masking, so things will start to blend together. Um, and sound localization sometimes gets hard. So it's sometimes difficult to like pinpoint where sound is coming from, which is also a reason why sometimes you'll see senior clients. You guys have probably seen this. You've been talking to like your grandparents. They'll kind of like, they'll go like this. They'll like turn their head a certain way. And that's because they're trying to hear you a little bit better. Um, 
and then balance, mobility, and falls, all the stuff that we kind of already talked about. Um, behavioral changes that we do see as we get older, um, we see sometimes like changes actually in personality, but generally we'll see like um, attention spans are a little bit shorter. The ability to learn new information is a little bit slower, um, which is why like a lot of times when you're working with senior clients, let's say you're doing like, and we're gonna talk about this later, but let's say you're doing like a complicated movement, something like a, you know, squat, curl to press, right? Like that's the movie. You're gonna be like, all right, we're gonna do a total body movement. It's called a squat, curl to press. I might not start my senior clients off with a complicated movement like that. I might instead have them hold on to dumbbells and be like, okay, we're gonna do what's called a dumbbell squat. And I'll have them do a set where they just do some kind of classic squats. Then it's like, great, that was really good. Now we're gonna add on to that and we're gonna do a squat to curl. So now when you're done with that squat, I want you to come up and give me a bicep curl. So then we'll do a set of that. Then I'll do a squat curl to press. And so it'll be like, okay, so now, you're gonna do the squat, you can do the curl just like you did, but now you're also gonna flip your palms and do a shoulder press. And that technique is what is called a simple to complex set. And it's where you build from something really easy into something more complicated. So it's like, okay, we're gonna do some lunges. Now we're gonna do some lunges with a lateral raise. Now we're gonna do a lunge to lateral raise to balance, right? And so you just build it up more and more and more complicated. Um, and so, oh crap, it's in the power. I, I was only reading this top line. I wasn't down here yet. The ability to learn new skills is sometimes diminished. So you might start with a seated bicep curl, then work them to a ball squat curl to press. <laughs> Can you tell I've taught this class before? Uh, <laughs> so um, those are some of the things that we wanna keep an eye on. Does that make sense, guys? Okay, so, um, Here's the thing though, we've been talking about aging until now, we've been talking about getting older, but we haven't really talked about getting younger because it doesn't really make much sense when people are like, what do you mean get younger? Well, remember functional aging, right? Um, or secondary aging, right? This is like, you can reverse some of the negative effects of aging, right? So we know that one of the best ways to do this is through physical activity. So looking at the positive effects of physical activity, right? We are gonna see an increase in brain volume, especially with aerobic exercise. Now, I did not get to talk about, the, I mean, I did, I, I mentioned, I remember mentioning it um, in the youth class, but there is something special about aerobic training. It is very, very good for your brain. Um, it has very, very positive effects in the brain. So cardiorespiratory exercise, especially with your senior clients, has actually been shown to increase brain volume, which is awesome. And I think honestly, it just has to do with the fact that it's an incredibly, most cardio exercise is incredibly repetitive and it gives your nervous system just time to send the same signals over and over and over and over and over again. Now, cardio does not have to be on the treadmill. Your senior clients don't just have to get on a treadmill. They don't just have to get on a spin bike. Cardio could absolutely be strength training, right? Uh, if you do circuit training, right? Ball squat, curl to press, into a chest press, into a cable row, into a shoulder press, into bicep curls, into a cable press down, into walking lunges. Boom, total body into chest, back, shoulders, biceps, triceps, legs then you let them rest, go back to the top. You do that whole circuit, you're gonna be exhausted in like, you know, the best way. So um, that's a really, really great thing to consider. It has been shown uh, to have really positive effects there. Not to mention it's also been shown to reverse cardiovascular issues, especially in the brain, you know, which is another brain thing such as stroke, right? It has really positive effects on your blood vessels, on your heart, everything. So we love, love cardio. And then we also know um, that uh, working in terms of stabilization, strength, and power training has been shown to also be really effective for your nervous system as well. In fact, it's been shown to be the most effective for actually training your brain in terms of like developing proprioception. So you get the, in, you know, you get the development of like, you know, intelligences and things like that with cardio, but you 
also get like the balance and proprioception from things like integrated resistance training. So get that strength training in there. And then, like I said, you're getting the best of both worlds when you put them together and you do them as like a circuit. Um, balance programs that can enhance your proprioception, nothing but good things, right? Uh, do you guys have any questions on any of that stuff before we talk about uh, there's the brain, now we're going to move on to the muscles? No, I'm good. I'm liking the sound of this. <laughs> I know, right? People, yeah. have, people like, man, there's so many times where people will talk to me and they're like, they're like, oh, working out is so hard. I don't know how you do it all the time. And I'm like, I could go on for hours. <laughs> like, I could tell you, I could give you without stopping, as long as I were writing it down to make sure I don't double up, a hundred reasons. <laughs> Just like, without taking a break for water. You know? <laughs> Why I'm is with, it good for you? It's like, when, once you get in that zone, it's, um, yeah, it's quite refreshing. Right? Yeah. So it's good for routine. It's good for your brain. It's good for your body. It's good for your balance. It's good for your, everything. Your mood. Uh, <laughs> so I'm in such a good mood right now. I freaking, you know, just played sports in the park for two and a half hours before coming to this call. <laughs> so um, musculoskeletal changes. Uh, we do know that seniors experience a decrease in muscle mass uh, and an increase in body fat tissue as we get older. So um, that will often result in connective tissue elasticity decreases as well. Um, so as you lose muscle, which is more commonly referred to as atrophy, right? You know, we have that hypertrophy phase of, of training that's for muscle growth. Well, atrophy is the exact opposite of it. Um, and that's a decrease in muscle size. Um, but we also see a decrease in our muscle tissue elasticity. We do tend to get a little bit stiffer as we get older. Um, and we also see a reduction in type two muscle fibers, which makes sense considering that I just said we see decreases in size and type two fibers are the big ones, right? Well, as we get older, we start to see sort of a shift from type two into more type one types of fibers. Um, as we tend to get older, we see less uh, actin and myosin and we start to see like more mitochondria develop. Um, and so we sort of see that like decrease in size. Um, also, obviously, in the musculoskeletal system, we'll see a loss of bone tissue as we get older. Uh, osteoporosis, right, that depleted or compromised bone tissue, um, has been directly linked to two primary causes. One is lack of activity. That is absolutely the main one, and two is poor diet. So we do want to make sure that we are, you know, trying to avoid that loss of bone density by trying to be active and eat healthy, you know. Um, and then here's one, boy. Let me tell you, if we talk about like, let's go back up top uh, and we talk about, um, uh, there it is, biologic aging, which is a decline in the body, and then secondary, which is a pathological change. Um, this is me all over. Calcification of joint structures, which leads to decreased mobility in the joints. So as we get older, our body likes to calcify tissues. So, okay, well, those are really actually super, super crazy extreme cases. <laughs> uh, but this is actually the one I was looking for. What is that? Those are bone spurs? That's crazy. That is so painful. That is, I don't know what disease that is, but that looks brutal. Uh, here's a more common version, right? So see these little like structures right here? That is calcification of soft tissue. And what that is, is where you start to see like fascia and things like that. They actually start to build up little bits of calcium. There is a calcified Achilles tendon, which is brutal injury, by the way. And what that does is that leads to majorly decreased mobility um, in those tissues. And that is just something that tends to happen as we get older. Um, so calcification of tissues. This is, a, I have a very good example of this. And so we have a spinal stenosis. Right? And so when you see what is called spinal stenosis, what you start to see is a calcification, which causes crowding. So this is your spinal column, right? This is that thing that gets severed, which causes people to get paralyzed. Well, this is a canal. This is meant to be an empty hole here. Um, but 
what ends up happening is there gets extra little freaking tissues in here and this starts to get really narrow and then that spinal cord starts getting poked all day and it gets a little stiff and you get general back pain and that is a calcification of the spine which is something that runs in my family my mom hers got so bad that she broke four of the vertebrae in her back my, i know it happened to my grandpa as well but it, He's never told me like what actual injuries he has. And sure enough, I got it as well. <laughs> and I'm sure my kids will get it and it'll be, you know, the Benson side of my family's uh, curse. So that is calcification. I've got a 90 year old spine. <laughs> or at least it feels like it sometimes. Yeah, question. <laughs> yeah, is that usually mostly genetics or is that from like lack of uh, certain vitamins or? Um, I would say less vitamins. Um, although maybe like it could be from like a uh, poor diet, you know? Um, but I would say a lot of times it's biologic, um, and then lack of activity. Lack of activity oh. is definitely a big one. Um, which is why I'm moving more than my mom, because I'm determined to never break one of my discs. <laughs> having my grandpa, having my mom, it ain't happening to me. <laughs> um, but I do sometimes like you know, I'll work out really hard and my back will just be really stiff. And it's just because it was just dealing with much more impact than, you know, the average person. There's less space to move around. Uh, then we also see shortened tendons and ligaments. Very, very common. That can reduce your mobility um, by as much as 25%, which doesn't seem like a very high number, but think about it. Like if this is full range of motion, that's 25% less, you know, <laughs> like that's a huge difference. Um, so you will see like shortened tendons, shortened ligaments because those muscles tend to get really stiff. Um, a reduction in muscle muscular power. This one makes a lot of sense when you, again, you consider the fact that we see less type two muscle fibers. Um, and we'll see a decreased capacity for all of the normal daily activities. And this is sort of like the big one that kind of leads seniors to getting to a place where they're like, man, I really should start exercising, you know? Um, they start going to the gym more, they start exercising because they're like, you know what? I just noticed that everything in life is a little bit tougher than it used to be. You know, I had a hard time unloading groceries the other day. I never had a hard time doing that. I got winded going up the stairs, you know, little things like that. So we see like a, just a decreased general capacity as we get older, you know, that that's part of getting older. Um, so that one's kind of general. Um, that's not like a statistic or anything. Um, so those are some of the musculoskeletal changes, but again, exercise is here to save the day because it reduces the effects of aging. Um, so we will see like senior populations can still very much experience musculoskeletal adaptations, even if it's their first time ever working out. Um, so sedentary adults can experience like increases in muscle mass, strength, power, balance, proprioception, all that good stuff, right? Um, and we haven't even gotten to the cardiovascular system yet. Um, a lot of times you will even see uh, like people who have, you know, been active their entire life. Um, these are like seniors who have been exercising regularly. They're going to use this term master athletes, which I freaking love. Like I'm looking forward to being older. So you can just call me a master athlete. <laughs> I just want that title. And what that is, right? Um, Robert, we were talking about this yesterday, right? Um, it's that old dude, that like 50, 60, 70 year old guy on the basketball court that you just can't get around and he's just got his feet planted and you're trying to drive to the basket and you, you just bounce off him like a freaking brick wall. It's like, dude's a million years old, but he knows how to plant his feet, you know? He knows how to use the center of gravity. He's like, I've been playing this game for years. You know, <laughs> like that's a master athlete. Um, Robert, what was the name of that uh, league you were telling me about? What is it? Uh, oh, um, uh, the Golden Eagles of Boston or something like that? I can't really remember, but yeah, they're like 65 or 70 plus. Golden Knights? Golden Knights, maybe. I don't know. Senior hockey team. Oh, man. Yeah, there yeah. they go. That is nuts. The Springfield hockey. I'm just going to, I'm just going to. Look at this real quick. 
Skipping forward here. <laughs> yeah, those are them. 70, mm -hmm. The minimum age is 70? Or something like that, yeah. That is awesome. Freaking ice hockey. <laughs> That's the master athlete of master athletes, man. Are I mean, they not just for getting in fights and stuff, too, with hockey? I wonder if they do that with them. That's bad. I don't know. Can you imagine? <laughs> they're just fucking they're just high-sticking somebody. <laughs> Why? Well, they said, uh, uh, who's that? Not sure. Uh, athlete? The hockey player? Yeah, yeah. Um, they're like a 70-year-older league. Robert was telling me about them the other day. Oh, wow. That's crazy. That is amazing. I love this, man. This is going to be like a new obsession of mine. Like, I'm going to start learning how to play hockey now so I can move to Boston in my 70s. That's, that's so awesome. It's like, why not? You know, just because that's, of age. Look at Speedy, too. Did you guys see that? <laughs> like, fast. Has anybody in here ever been ice skating? It is horrendously hard. <laughs> oh, my God. All right. We got to get back. That was amazing. So that's master athletes, right? And what we do see, um, and this obviously makes perfect, this is such a no-brainer sentence, but it has to be said. Um, seniors who exercise regularly have been shown to maintain their muscle mass for way longer periods in their life, you know? Um, like that, that loss in body weight, that loss in type two muscle fibers, we just don't see that as much in people who exercise, you know, in, in, even if they're seniors. Um, I had this guy, Al, uh, who was 79 years old when he, when I first met him, um, and I got to, you know, we got to enjoy his 80th birthday when he was in the, in the gym. Um, and Al came to my group exercise classes. Like normally I will say most of my senior clients, they do one-on-ones, but this guy signed up for my group X classes, which, you know, are much less personal attention. They're usually a little more intense. They're about like calorie burn more than they are about like fixing overactive muscles so they're just like lots of burpees and you know battle ropes and all this stuff and al freaking loved it like he would show up and i'd get like people you know, these like girls in their like 20s uh, who were like i'm tired i don't want to do the last set can we just skip the last set and go into our stretches and al would be like come on it's burpee time let's do it <laughs> like he'd get on the ground and jump back up you know, which we're going to talk about how, like, you should not do things like burpees with seniors because it's a major change in blood pressure. But he loved him, man. He, he loved him. Um, apparently, he was absolutely brutal in golf, too. Apparently, he was a great golfer. I never went with him, but my boss did. <laughs> um, so, was, was the whole, I mean, has he always been active in his... Um... I think so. My dad actually knew who he was um, randomly. I told him... I told him uh, I was like, I have this client Al and blah, 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 blah. Uh, and he owns like a truck stop. My dad was like, what truck stop? And I was like, the, this one. And he was like, I go there all the time. And he's like, Al so-and-so? Jubitz, that's his last name. And uh, my dad was like, yeah, my dad knew him, which is totally weird. Um, but yeah, he'd been, I think he'd been active his whole life. I actually couldn't tell you. He seemed like it though. You know what I mean? Um, you know, he, like you could tell he dressed the part, like he always had, like he had those like knee high socks. <laughs> so it's like, you see somebody like that and you're like, this guy played his fair share of pickup basketball. <laughs> um, bone mass retention that help that happens with staying active and in, in, in your senior years. And then we see a d reduction in arthritis. Um, now I remember arthritis is like a wear down of like all those soft tissues. So we do see a reduction in that type of disease with our senior clients because they're keeping their muscles strong. So there's going to be less impact in the joints, right? Their muscles can handle that sort of impactful mo type of movement. And so that's one of the reasons why we see like the aches and pains associated with arthritis. Those do decrease when you are active in your senior years. Um, as long as it's not, I will say, as long as it's not like rheumatoid arthritis, um, Honestly, there is not a ton we can do about rheumatoid arthritis. It is an autoimmune disorder. Um, all right, and then changes we see in our cardiovascular system. Obviously, we've uh, kind of already talked a little bit about this, but we will see a decrease in, you know, uh, the uh, transportation of like our heart, blood, and blood vessels. Now, for the most part, there's not a lot of like physical changes. 
with the exception of the heart chambers itself tend to get a little bit larger and the blood vessels tend to get a bit thinner. And so we're going to see a thinning of blood vessels in like our capillaries. We're going to refer to that as arteriosclerosis, or we'll see like a hardening of those arteries, which we're going to call atherosclerosis. Um, and that's going to result in decreased blood flow to those tissues. This is also why we think of like seniors um, bruising kind of easily. Uh, those capillaries are thinner. It's much easier to break them and then, you know, blood starts leaking out and so it causes a bruise. Um, we will see an enlarged heart. This is also one of the reasons we actually see a lower resting heart rate in our senior clients. Um, one more reason we definitely want to use the carbonin formula um, and the, uh, you know, that heart rate reserve method whenever we are assigning a, a target heart rate. Um, we'll see stiffer and thicker arteries as well. Um, so we'll see thinner capillaries. Sometimes we'll see thicker arteries. Now, when I say thicker, as we get older, biologically, they should be thinning, but you will sometimes see thicker arteries because of the buildup of plaque, right? Um, so that is a bad thing, you know? Uh, we start to see like this buildup of atherosclerosis. I don't really like how they're describing that. Why is there a can of Pepsi here? <laughs> um, I don't really like how they are describing that as like, thicker arteries. What they mean is like hardening of the arteries. Um, so stiffer arteries. Um, and that is obviously going to lead to hypertension problems, which is very dangerous. Um, um, where am I at? I'm lost. Uh, decreased efficiency. Oh, uh, we also will. Oh, this is a big one. We also will see a decreased efficiency um, of the uh, cardiovascular system. So as we as we get older, um, your nervous system. Remember, your nervous system is actually what triggers your cardiovascular systems. Like, like your cardiovascular system is your heart beating, right? And your heart setting its own rhythm. But it is getting all of these signals from your nervous system. It's your autonomic nervous system. It's not like the the conscious part of your brain. It's not somatic, it's autonomic, but it is still your nervous system. So because the nervous system tends to slow down a little bit, um, your heart's response to exercise tends to be a little bit slow, which is why a lot of times we'll actually want to extend our warmups and extend our cool downs so we can kind of ease into exercise and ease out of things. Because if your nervous system is not like responding, you might be like exercising, but then all of a sudden your muscles start burning like crazy because there's not blood flow coming in there to like get rid of that lactic acid because your heart hasn't really gotten the signal. It's like, hey, we're working out, you know? <laughs> and so all of a sudden your heart's like, crap, and you know, and then it starts kind of overbeating. So that's, that's something we do need to be aware of. Um, also, as we get older in your respiratory system, we'll see some structural changes too. Uh, we'll see a decrease in the elasticity of your, of your actual lungs. So sometimes it becomes harder to bring in as much gas. Without as much gas, you're not getting as much oxygen. Without as much oxygen, it's going to be, you know, harder to breathe. Um, and then sometimes we'll see that enlarged alveoli. So remember we were talking about this when we talked about COPD, uh, enlarged alveoli. As we get older, you know, your alveoli might actually, the walls of them might actually collapse and burst together. And so then you can see here, right? These are a whole bunch of like little tiny ones, whereas these are kind of big giant holes. And that's because the walls between them have broken. There's less surface area in this version versus this version. That's something that happens as we get older. So your ability to um, diffuse oxygen into your blood is decreased as we get older. Um, we will also see a weaker diaphragm and weaker core muscles, um, which is going to also result in less air coming in. So all that to say, you are going to see a decreased um, functional capacity when it comes to cardio. You know, like uh, this is one of the reasons why we use the heart rate max formula. It's literally based on your age. It's 220 minus your age. It's not the world's greatest formula, but it's also not terrible. You know, it is taking into account, it's like, yeah, as we get older, the how hard our heart can work is going to be reduced because we don't breathe as well. We don't pump blood as well. All those things, right? Um, so uh, here's what's awesome, though. 
we do know that we have positive effects from exercising. So uh, we see a reduced risk for coronary heart disease. Obviously, I've, we've spent plenty of time talking about how exercise is going to reduce your risk for heart disease. Um, we're going to see an increase in your stroke volume, which is great. Remember stroke volume, right? Um, you've got heart rate. That's how often your heart beats. And stroke volume is how much blood is being pumped out of your heart every time your heart beats. So both of those things together, like make up your cardiac output, that's the performance of your heart. We want that stroke volume to be as high as possible. So by exercising regularly and making your client use their heart, you're teaching the heart how to squeeze harder and it's going to more efficiently and more effectively pump blood. The greater the stroke volume, the more efficient the heart. Then you don't have to beat your heart as much in order to deliver the same amount of blood. So, um, honestly, that's actually about it. Summarize, we already kind of talked about this on our senior day, but summarizing everything up, we do know we have really positive neurological benefits, um, increased speed, increased memory, increased balance, increased proprioception. We'll have really positive musculoskeletal benefits, um, you know, de uh, increases in muscular uh, bone mass, increases in muscle strength, um, decreases in joint stiffness. We have really positive effects on cardiovascular with like an increased um, stroke volume, which would reduce your heart rate rate, uh, and we can increase your lung uh, capacity. And one thing they're not talking about here is exercise also um, develops more cardiovascular enzymes, which have really positive effects. And that can mean that you need less oxygen in order to do more work. And that's another benefit that's, that's not really listed up here, but is a benefit of cardio in general. Um, so um, yeah, question. Yeah. So Brad, you know, the stroke volume is that yesterday like you know how um jesse had his um hand on my neck is that an example of the stroke volume where the heart um oh you mean like how you couldn't feel it at your wrist no 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 like how it was kind of like jim carrey's heart you know how it was like it oh you just be really yeah hard. yeah no not necessarily i mean maybe um you know what that maybe i i cannot say with authority yes or no because i don't think external signs of beating may or may not be tied to actual heart performance. <laughs> like, uh, been, like I know what you're talking about. There's been times where I've like looked down and I've done like during cardio and I can see my shirt move because my <laughs> heart's beating so hard. Yeah. Uh, Cause I'm a very skinny guy. <laughs> I bet if I had some more muscle up here, I wouldn't be able to see that. Uh, <laughs> um, so I, I don't know, um, but I do know stroke volume is how much blood gets ejected from the heart every time it beats. So if it beats harder, you're able to pump more blood. Oh. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I, I've never read anything. Could be. I mean, what you're saying makes sense, but it's one of those things where I'm like itchy and nervous um, because a lot of times when something makes sense, it's almost, it's, it's misleading. <laughs> so I don't want to say yes or no, but I should look that up. <laughs> um, you guys have any other questions tonight? You guys excited about the senior class? I know sometimes people are like, Ugh. it's like, they're, and I'm like, no, this is a great class. This has got some really fun stuff in it. <laughs> um, but questions, comments, concerns? I felt like uh, you were teaching me how to train my grandparents today. Right, yeah. <laughs> That's the thing, man. Go get your folks moving, you know? <laughs> Hopefully your folks listen to you more than mine. My parents, no fair. <laughs> Master Brad, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right? Master athlete. I'm probably, that's probably, I'm not going to lie. I am... My roommates and I are doing movie night at, at eight o'clock in like an hour. Uh, and I'm going to put up the, I got to get the video and stuff uploaded, but I'm probably going to pull up that old hockey team on my phone and watch videos about it while I'm putting up tonight's upload. <laughs> love it. That's um, so bad. Right. Oh, I love it. Um, speaking of, uh, I know the email didn't go out today. It's because we didn't do a recording this morning. Um, so Canvas, it'll go up in like about a half hour because I already did all the stuff. All I have to do is wait for the video to download. So it shouldn't take too long. Um, and you'll get an email from me in just a little bit. 
Uh, but cool. other than that, um, if you haven't done it yet, knock out your PFT 106 homeworks. Get those caught up um, so that we don't go into this class lagging behind. And uh, I'll see you guys tomorrow night or tomorrow right. morning. Peace out. See you later, everybody. Right, I'll see you guys.